Welcome to this lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to be discussing the biomechanical frame of reference. Uh, the biomechanical frame of reference is one of the um, frames of reference commonly used in occupational therapy. Um, so as we know, in occupational therapy, our conceptual uh, models or generic occupational therapy models, they help us explain why we do what we do. And then we have frames of reference that guide us on how we do what we do. So we're going to discuss the biomechanical frame of reference and the assessments and interventions that it actually guides us to use uh, if we are using this uh, particular frame of reference. Uh, from my experience, the biomechanical frame of reference is actually one of the frames of reference that can that are easily understood, uh, especially by by students. This frame of reference is based on kinematics and kinetics. Kinematics being the study of motion of bodies and kinetics being the study of relationships between forces acting on a body. It, it tends to view the body as a functioning machine uh, that is made up of specific components that are connected in specific ways and are expected to function in specific ways. Um, the biomechanical frame of reference also uses principles um, of mechanics or mechanical principles to address an individual's motion during occupational performance. This frame of, frame of reference is not only used in occupational therapy, but it's also used by many other disciplines um, because of obviously of its origins and the aspects that it addresses. Um, moving on to the key focus uh, of this frame of reference, it mainly focuses on the musculoskeletal capacity to perform occupation. And the major three major aspects for this frame of reference are joint range of motion, meaning the extent and direction of movement that a joint can achieve. Uh, the second one is muscle strength. Uh, that's the force or the tension that is generated by a muscle when it contracts. Um, you might want also to refer it as a measure of power generated by a muscle. And then the third one is endurance, being the ab ability uh, to remain active during an activity or the capacity for muscles to contract repeatedly without, uh, without getting tired. So it, it measures that, that's, that's the endurance. Uh, there are secondary aspects. To, to those three that I just mentioned. And the secondary aspects include balance, um, joint stability, as well as joint mobility. So there's a difference there between joint range of motion and joint mobility. Joint mobility refers to the ease with, with, with which uh, the joint moves from, from one position to the other. So what are we aiming to do? When we're using the biomechanical frame of reference, we are aiming to either increase or restore, it might be uh, joint range of motion, muscle, muscle strength, uh, physical endurance. We can also use it um, if we are aiming to prevent deformity or if we're aiming to decrease the effects of, um, of uh, deformities of the body. Who do we use the biomechanical frame of reference with? We generally use this frame of reference whenever we know that um, our service user or our client is having problems that are affecting their range, joint range of motion, muscle strength, or their endurance. So this could be people who are having fractures, um, arthritic conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, soft tissue injuries, for example, um, muscle injuries, injuries to the ligaments or tendons, people with amputations, um, people with, uh, with, uh, with pain, uh, people with peripheral nerve damage, or people with uh, cardiorespiratory problems that affect their endurance. Generally, when we are using the biomechanical frame of reference, we would expect the central nervous system of the client or service user to be intact. The reason being, if the central nervous system is affected, for example, in traumatic brain injuries or in stroke, uh, that's your cardiovascular accident, you will actually realize that the muscle tone will be affected when the central nervous system is involved. 
So if the central nervous system is involved and muscle tone is involved, that will automatically affect um, the other uh, aspects that we were looking at, like gen the joint range of motion and muscle strength. So it, it wouldn't be very ideal to use the biomechanical frame of reference um, to, to address those problems that are coming from abnormal muscle tone. Uh, we would rather select a different frame of reference, for example, the neurodevelopmental frame of reference to address problems that are associated with the central nervous system. But for the um, uh, biomechanical frame of reference, we would generally expect the service user to have an intact or, or a functioning um, mature central nervous system. <clears throat> However, experienced therapists, they can still use the biomechanical frame of reference uh, with service users who may be having um, an affected central nervous system. For example, in wheelchair prescription, because some of the principles of the biomechanical frame of reference, they actually allow therapists to make decision term, decisions in terms of uh, the angles at which the person will need to sit in order to prevent deformity and things like that. Um, and then moving on to the settings where the biomechanical frame of reference is commonly used. It's commonly used in falls, it's uh, pain management, hand therapy, vocational rehab, assistive technology. Uh, generally, wherever we have service users who are having problems with their range of motion, their muscle strength, as well as their endurance, the, the biomechanical frame of reference is usually um, appropriate to use. So as we know, frames, they guide us on how to do what we do. So when using the biomechanical frame of reference, um, there are certain assessments that this frame of reference actually guide, guides us in terms of uh, using. Um, I will start uh, with the assessments that are focusing on performance components, where we assess the performance components. And generally, in some texts, you might actually find these assessments being referred to as um, assessments that are used when using a bottom-up assessment. Uh, basically, what it means is that if you're using a bottom-up assessment, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to um, assess the occupations. It just means that you're starting uh, with the performance components going upwards. Okay, But sometimes you might find that in, in some settings, uh, these assessments can be used without progressing to uh, the occupational or the functional assessments. So the first uh, component that we can assess if we're using the biomechanical frame of reference is joint range of motion. Um, we can assess joint range of motion by observing, asking, for example, a service user to move their, their arm or their limb. We can actually be able to observe if there's a limitation in, in, in their um, joint range of motion, but that would not be very objective uh, because we're just observing them moving. So if you want really to be objective, to be able to know at what angle they're able to, to move, what we then need to do is to use goniometry. Uh, we, we use goniometers to measure uh, joint range of motion for, for all the joints um, within, within the limbs. Um, identify the joints and then their plane of movement, and then we, we can be able to measure that and objectively document uh, the, the angle at which the joint is, is moving. Um, the goniometers come in different forms and, 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 and shapes. Um, they can be the manual ones, like the ones on the picture, and then the green ones, those are electronic goniometers where you just attach um, the two parts, one distal to the joint, the other one proximal to the joint, and then request the service user to move the joint, and then you can then be able to measure the, um, the joint range of motion. So that's, that's one. The second one is dexterity. <clears throat> dexterity basically is the rate of manipulation, the speed at which we can use our fingers and the accuracy when, when uh, performing a, a task. Uh, so there, there are a number of tests that can be used by occupational therapists to test for dexterity. Um, here I've just put two examples. That's the nine hole peg test, as well as the box and block test. Each of the assessments that I'm going to be talking about, they have their clear instructions in terms of how we use them. So it's important when selecting an assessment, 
you have to read about that assessment, what are the requirements and how is it administered so that you have a, a good understanding of how to do that. Then, so we've talked about uh, assessing range of motion. Now we move on to assessing muscle strength. Muscle strength, we can actually assess using the manual muscle testing grading system, commonly known as uh, MMT, some, in some places referred to as the Oxford scale. You might have heard or you, you might come across um, uh, information saying the service user has got uh, um, muscle strength, MMT grade two, for their elbow flexors, or they are having uh, grade three for their shoulder abductors. Um, so the table on the right, it actually shows you um, the grading uh, that is given to the muscles. And when do we say this muscle is grade uh, one? When do we say this is uh, two or plus two? So I will, I will allow you to read, to read that uh, for yourself, but that's one of the tests um, that we can use when we want to uh, measure or assess uh, muscle strength. Uh, within healthcare settings um, and MGT teams, it's very common for, for this, uh, for this uh, MMT to be used. And you might see in the uh, patient's notes that they, they are recording the strength of the muscle strength of the uh, person uh, or the service user for the specific muscle groups. So that, that's what will be used, the, the MMT. <laughs> we can also uh, assess grip strength using a dynamometer, that's a JAMA dynamometer on that, on that, uh, on that picture. Um, also, it comes with a set of instructions in terms of how do you position the person and how do you measure. Usually you take three, three measurements and then you take an average to get an idea of the person's grip strength. You can also be comparing the affected uh, hand and the non-affected hand. We also have uh, the pinch meter. The pinch meter basically measures uh, the pinch strength, that's uh, for the fingers. And then for endurance, we can measure endurance in terms of the cardiorespiratory endurance. We can also measure um, endurance in terms of the functional endurance. So functional endurance is commonly used in occupational therapy. What we are looking at there is basically the time that the person is able to sustain an activity. Um, if, they, if they are to stand, for how long are they able to stand? Um, if, if they are going to be uh, taking a shower, for how long are they able to actually uh, sustain involvement in that occupation? So functional endurance we can measure based on time. Uh, we can also observe. And then there is also edema. Or we can measure edema by observing, um, like the image of uh, the person seated with two hands, we can actually see or we can actually observe that their left hand is actually swollen, that's edema. We can go on further to test what type of swelling this is, whether it's pitting edema or non-pitting edema. When it's pitting or organized edema, it tells us that uh, it's more of chronic edema. Um, we can also measure edema using a tape measure. Uh, usually this is a figure of eight that we use on the hand, uh, obviously using those anatomical landmarks to just make sure that we are measuring it consistently and we're able to compare uh, the measurements from the baseline until the time when we've uh, um, provided some interventions to see whether there is progress. We can also measure edema using a volumeter. So a volumeter is basically that equipment there on the uh, first image. Uh, where the image is filled with water until there's no more water dripping. And then uh, the swollen hand is then brought in. And then the water that is displaced by the swollen hand is then collected and measured in terms of uh, milliliters. And then um, when treatment or intervention has been provided and you want to reassess, you can still do the same and compare the readings, the initial reading from the uh, reading post intervention to see if we are making a difference in the in the uh, patient's swelling. We can also measure uh, sensation. Sensation is classified as there's light touch, there's pressure, there's thermal, and then there's uh, sensation to pain. Um, so we can also be able to to measure those aspects uh, using uh, different kits 
for for testing sensation or those filaments that are shown in that image. Um, the algometer can also be used to test uh, when we're assessing uh, or measuring pressure, uh, sensation to pressure. Uh, sensation to pain, sometimes we can actually use, commonly use the visual analog scale, which helps us uh, to at least have an idea of the way in which the service user is perceiving the pain. So they can score it in terms of numbers. They can use the, uh, the facial expressions shown on that scale. There are actually a wide range of, uh, of pain scales that can be used to assess pain. Now, we've, I've just discussed the um, assessments for the performance components, uh, which was referring to as assessments that we normally start with if we are using a bottom-up approach. Now I'm moving on to assess the occupation-based assessments, um, these mainly used in occupational therapy as well. And they are commonly used if we're using a top-down uh, approach where we want, we are more interested in um, assessing or evaluating occupation um, rather than just looking at the performance components, just looking at the range of motion. So here's a list of some of the examples there. It's, it's not exhaustive. Uh, we can use the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, um, commonly known as the COPAM, um, where the service user can actually uh, tell the therapists the occupations that they uh, consider to be important to them, and then they can also uh, rate their satisfaction with their performance of those, those occupations. We also have the Battle Index. This is a, a, an assessment tool, a standardized assessment tool as well, that is used when we are assessing uh, mainly self-care activities. It has got 10 activities that include uh, feeding, bathing, grooming, using the toilet, mobility, transfers, and things like that. Um, we can use it to, to assess that. We can also use the uh, dash or quick dash. <clears throat> the disabilities of the arm, shoulder, and hand, commonly used by occupational therapists and other, other team members as well, uh, but it relates to uh, occupational performance um, for people with uh, injuries that are affecting their arm, shoulder, and hands. We can also use the OSA, that's your self occupational self-assessment. Um, we also have a whole lot of um, self-reporting assessments that can be used by occupational therapists, like the role checklist, interest checklist. Um, model of human occupation screening tool, MoHOST, is also another popular one that we could use. Um, and then we also have our functional assessments where the service user actually performs an occupation. It might be within their uh, self-care domain, productivity, or leisure depending on their interest and what is meaningful to them, we can actually observe them performing those, those occupations and see if there are any limitations, <clears throat> as well as the strengths that they'll be having. Um, and then we can also use um, environmental assessments, for example, home assessments or work, work assessments. Um, we can do these, these assessments with the, with the biomechanical frame of reference. Moving on to the interventions, um, obviously we can have our occupational based interventions where we focus on specific occupations that are meaningful to the to the service user, and then we actually help them to actually engage in those in those occupations. Um, sometimes we might use assistive technology, we might use uh, environmental adaptations or modifications, splinting and orthotics, for example, enhanced um, it's interventions that we we can use. Uh, functional retraining sometimes, uh, range of motion, uh, strengthening exercises, endurance, but sometimes these may not be purely um, occupation based. We can also use joint protection techniques, particularly for uh, people with um, arthritic conditions. Therapeutic exercise also commonly used in hand therapy. Um, when providing these interventions using the biomechanical frame of reference, there's an emphasis on grading of, uh, of um, grading principles. So we can upgrade our intervention or downgrade it. So we upgrade by increasing complexity or maybe increasing the time if we're working on endurance, increasing resistance if we're working on muscle strength so that we can increase the muscle strength, increasing distance if we're working on joint range of motion, or to downgrade we then reduce, we can reduce the time or reduce the resistance, reduce the distance so that the, the service user is having the just right challenge. 
there are some limitations. Um, firstly, uh, this frame of reference does not automatically provide for client-centered practice because of that view of the body like a machine with different components. The client may be less engaged and non-compliant as they can actually play a more passive role when we're using this frame of reference. Um, it can be reductionistic, does not automatically incorporate strengths of uh, OT service delivery based on our OT philosophy. Um, being occupation-based, not that much. Being holistic, we can't say it's a sort of like a holistic frame of reference. So as a result, when we are using this frame of reference, we usually use it in conjunction with other frames of reference. For example, we might say we're using the biomechanical frame of reference together with the client-centered frame of reference. Sometimes we start with the biomechanical frame of reference and then end up including the rehabilitative or compensatory frame of reference, depending on the needs of the, the service user. Um, the merits for this frame of reference, um, it's generally attractive to some OTs, especially in acute settings. They can easily use adjunct methods and enabling activities. Um, Communication between MDT members is easy because some MDT members already use uh, the biomechanical approach in their practice. It can also be used to achieve occupation as an end. There is uh, this, this discussion around occupation as a means and occupation as an end. So by occupation as an end, we're basically saying we are, <coughs> we are providing an intervention that may not be purely occupation based, but our aim is for the person to engage in an occupation that's occupation as an end and uh, for us to use uh, occupation as a means it means we are using occupation as a therapeutic medium we are using occupation as the intervention um, but for us to do this when using the biomechanical frame of reference it requires what is called an occupational filter where the therapist actually makes it intentional to be creative so that uh, we incorporate the principles of the biomechanical frame of reference into um, um, the treatment using occupation as the therapeutic medium. This uh, frame of reference is commonly used with uh, um, the following conceptual models. Of course, there are many more other conceptual models that you can also be able to use the biomechanical uh, frame of reference with, but SIMOP E, MOHO, PEO. Um, POP, they are commonly used um, um, together with the biomechanical frame of reference. Okay, thank you very much. These are the references that I've been using. All right, thank you.